Turn please in our hymn books to the hymn number 56. The hymn number 56 on the page 198. The hymn 56, page 198, join all the glorious names of wisdom, love and power that mortals ever knew, that angels ever go. Hymn 56, and we'll stand together. Than his. 
or one who would come to be our representative, for one who would come to bear away our sin, for one who would be that leading substitute. Lord, we thank Thee for the blessed imputation of righteousness to us. We thank Thee that this evening He pleads in the glory for us. Lord, as we come here, we sense something of our own inabilities and lack. Thank Thee that we can have that upward look to gaze upon our blessed Lord. We thank Thee, dear Lord, for the privilege to come and meet in this place this evening. We pray, dear Lord, that we will be very conscious that the Lord is among us, that the Lord is speaking to us. Pray that thy word will come with freshness, that we might be built up through thy truth this evening. Touch every waiting heart. O Lord, we pray that there will be that word from heaven for us. We recognize that no matter where we are in our Christian journey, we're always in need of that word from thyself. We pray then that we will hear. Lord speaking to us, the Lord touching our hearts. Come then, draw near to us, build us up in faith we pray. Remember those that cannot be with us, we do pray very especially for the sick, that your hand will be upon them. We pray for Matt this evening, that you will be with him there in the hospital, and we pray that will be seen to speedily. We pray that uh, Matt will be restored to full health and strength again speedily, we pray. Oh Lord, we pray for others that would love to be in God's house. We pray for those that are shut in continuously, that you'll be with them. We pray that those that are unable to be out and about, that they will even know the presence of the Lord to be with them. And that gracious sense that the Lord is there to minister that word and season. So Lord, come and undertake the prayer of our Lord's good in the end. Amen. We're going to sing together, please, the words of the hymn 305. Brother Bevis isn't with us this evening, as I was mentioning in prayer. Uh, Matt took sick today, and Bevis has had to take him to hospital with pain, and we pray that the Lord will watch over them this evening. So it's the hymn 305, when your anchor hold, in the storms of life, when the clouds unfold their wings of strength. We have an anchor that keeps the soul. 305, and we'll stand as we sing this.
place in God's Word to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. Ephesians and the chapter 5. Here we have this great chapter giving directions to the Christian family. Our homes are to be ordered. So we're going to read, please, from the verse 18. Ephesians 5 and the verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. We'll end there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. We'll have the catechism this time, the larger catechism, and it is the question five. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. So the questions leading up to this have been dealing with the subject of the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. And so then question five is asking what is the great message of the Holy Scriptures. Uh, this question really is an introduction to the rest of the Catechism. So the Scripture, according to this answer, teaches two principal things. First of all, Christian doctrine. What man is to believe concerning God. We are to believe what is true about God. 
And so the scriptures reveal the truth about God to us. And so the next section of the Catechism then deals with the whole issue of sin and God's plan of redemption. God's plan to bring a people to himself. And in that we, we learn concerning God. But then the, the Catechism says the scriptures also teach us about our duty. What duty God requires of man. And the latter part of the Catechism then deals with those issues. And so we have the section dealing with the sacraments. We have the section dealing with the Lord's Prayer. The section dealing with the commandments. These are all teaching us our duty. Uh, this, of course, is an effective summary of the Christian life. What is it that the Christian is to do? We are to learn more about God, and then we are to put what we learn into practice. The life of the Christian is not to be a head knowledge life only, but we are to be growing in grace and practicing the very things that we learn. May the Lord bless those few thoughts to our hearts. Thank you all for coming this evening. It's good to see each one gathered with us, and we appreciate you coming to meet with us at the house of the Lord. After the preaching of God's Word this evening, there will be a season of prayer. And so today has been set aside as a special day of prayer and fasting for the work of God here as we enter into a new year of labor in the work of God. And so after the service this evening, there will be that time of prayer. If you're not able to stay for the time of prayer, you will be able to leave. The prayer meetings, as usual, this week the men's prayer meeting tomorrow at 7, then also the prayer meeting of Bible study here on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. The service is next Lord's Day at the usual times, so and God willing, I'll be here next week. Lord's Day. We're going to turn in our hymn books again, please, to the hymn 747. 747. This is the favourite of many in the congregation, and certainly it is our prayer for the families of our congregation. It will give us hopes built firm upon the Saviour, where Christ is head and counsellor. And again, 747, we're going to remain seated as the offering for God's work is received. 747.
going to turn, please, in God's Word to Psalm 128. Psalm 128, coming back to these songs of the Greece. As I mentioned, the way there at the very beginning of these studies, some believe that the songs are related to Hezekiah, how he was given 15 additional years to live, and the association that had with the sundial and the degrees. And so we had these 15 extra years, 15 psalms in this particular section. In this particular psalm, as one that has, has as one of its themes domestic happiness. In those 15 years, Hezekiah was granted a son, Manasseh. Of course, if you know the story, Manasseh's reign in the early years of it was not in keeping with this psalm, he was an idolater, though in later life he did repent, it was sadly his son Amnon, Amnon never humbled himself before the Lord. A more common view concerning these psalms is that they were used to travel to Jerusalem for feasts. Some have suggested that the link between this psalm and going to Jerusalem for feasts is that yes, you go to Jerusalem for the feasts, but the importance of the home life remains. We'll read the words of the psalm together. Psalm 128, verse 1. Blessed is every one that feareth the Lord, that walketh in all his ways. For thou shalt eat the labour of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine, by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon thee. Israel. We'll seek the Lord's face together in prayer. Let's ask that the Lord will take his divine truth and write it upon our hearts. Our gracious Father, we pray that your word will be saved to every heart this evening, that we might be strengthened through thy truth. And oh Lord, we do pray that the hopes that are of you here will be homes that we have, that the peace of the Lord, the blessing, the happiness of God will be known in our homes. So grant that needed help in the Word, we pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. The opening sentence of Psalm 128 is one that I'm sure the unconverted might call into question. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. Happy is everyone that feareth the Lord. The unconverted may see in that a contradiction. How could you be happy while living fear? Yet the psalmist is absolutely correct. Fear here. Living in fear is living in that reverential fear. Living a life that is full of a sense of the greatness of God and a humbling of heart as a result. The man that fears the Lord in that way will be the happiest man on earth. The latter part of verse 1 really explains the first part. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. That is, the one that is walking with the Lord is one that fears the Lord. Now, if I fear someone in a petrified way, I won't want to walk with them. I want to stay away from them, keep my distance. 
So that's not what's in view here. But if I hold someone in the highest regard, if I honor them, it would be expected that I would be glad to be with them. So then, as the one that is born again, as he fears God, he desires to walk with him. He once was in terror. And the unconverted man, he ought to fear the Lord in that sense of being in terror before the Lord, fearing what it would be to have God with him. someone is brought to experience salvation, he is to live from that type of view, and brought to realize the wonder of grace, that the Lord has delivered him from being separated, brought him into that glorious union with himself. The psalm said in Psalm 89 verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints. We had in reverence of all of them that are about him. So to be in reverence before God does not bring miserableness. It brings happiness. To be serious about the things of God does not bring miserableness. If someone is serious about God in the right sense, it will bring happiness. You think about Abraham. When he brought his son Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice, the angel of the Lord acknowledged that Abraham had feared God. Did that fear bring Abraham into a state of misery? Not at all. What blessing to have a son restored to him. We think of the midwives in the beginning of the book of Exodus said that they did as they did because they feared God. Were they miserable? And I suspect not at all. On the evening of the men's prayer meeting, I read concerning the children of the Lord as they crossed the Red Sea. And then they saw the destruction of the Egyptians. Exodus 14, 31, the people feared the Lord. What is Exodus 15 about? The song that was sang as a result of the destruction of the Egyptians. Fearing the Lord led to great joy. Psalm 128 divides into two clear sections. The verses 1 to 3 are the first section, and then the last three verses, the second section. And each section begins with this thought that the one that fears God is happy. So verse 1, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. And verse 2 continues that, Happy shalt thou be. Then verse 4, the second section, Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. Now there are two different Hebrew words that are used here. So verses 1 and 2, and there's a different Hebrew word used than verses 4 and 5. Why is that? Well, perhaps what the psalmist is seeking to emphasize that the one that truly fears God, he is happy and blessed in the broad sense. These two words have a similar meaning, though perhaps there is a little distinction. The word in verse 1 and 2, blessed, has especially to do with happiness. This is the word from which Asher got his name. If you remember when Leah gave birth to Asher, she talked about happiness, happy am I, for the daughters will call me happy, or they will call me blessed, as it's translated, and she called his name Asher. Happy, happy one. Anna, in Luke chapter 2, came from that tribe, the tribe of Asher. She was certainly one that feared the Lord, and yet knew happiness. Then verses 4 and 5, the word blessed is the word that is more often translated blessed in the 
Old Testament. It's that word that's used in creation. God's blessing was upon the fifth day with the sea and air creatures. There was that blessing upon man in creation. God blessed the seventh day. And the sense then of that word is that God has placed his favor upon something or someone. So that's the sense here in verse 4. There is this idea of happiness as we have in verse 1. But there is this additional idea. I am happy because I have the Lord's favour upon me. The Lord has looked favourably upon me. The Lord has blessed me in that sense. And the blessing then of the psalm is this domestic blessing. And that's certainly the emphasis of the first three verses. Uh, surely that is something that is very absent in today's society. Isn't it a tragic thing that so many homes are unhappy? Yet the Lord's promise is that if we fear the Lord, if we walk with Him, our homes are to be happy places. But this is a general promise. It's not denying that some God-fearing people have real problems at home. So there are some that truly walk with God, and yet they face great difficulties with their spouse or others, perhaps rebellious children. But the general expectation upon God's people is to be this, that where there is a God-fearing man, there will be a happy hope. God-fearing man will impact upon his wife and children. Verse 3, thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children, like olive plants round about thy table, will come back to this shortly. But here there is this idea. The man is happy. And what blessing there is with the wife and children in that home. Then the, the second part of the psalm emphasizes not only this domestic happiness, we do see that domestic happiness in verse 6, thou shalt see thy children's children. So there is this idea of longevity and the blessing that will come with that. But there is also national happiness. Verse 5, the Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. Thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. At the end of verse 6, peace will be upon Israel. And so as there is this blessing in the home, which of course is one of the great building blocks of society, this is to flow out into the nation. And this of course was particularly true then for Old Testament Israel. And the great fulfillment of this is that as God blesses Christian homes, this blessing flows out into the wider Christian church. Though, of course, there is a sense that we can apply that to the nation as well. If there are godly homes in a nation, then we should expect that there would be blessing in the nation. Isn't that what our your forefathers longed for. And such would be the transformation of hopes that the nations would then be transformed. Yet if that's all we take out of this psalm, I think we will feel that there's some lack. And that's why in coming through these psalms I've sought to direct your attention continually to Christ in these psalms. And so there's much that we can take for, as far as practical lessons in these psalms, and I hope tonight that there are practical lessons in the message. But I want you to see Christ in this psalm. And as, as I've said before in these studies, when we read of the blessed man in the psalms, going right back to Psalm 1, the blessed man most especially is Christ Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, 
that walketh in his ways. Thou shalt see the labor of thine hands. Verse 4. Behold that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Who has feared the Lord more than the perfect man? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 5 verse 7 speaks of how the prayers of Christ were heard in that he feared. The marginal reference there relates to the subject of submission. Christ was submissive to the Father. He honoured the Father. And he was indeed then most happy. What I want to take then from this psalm this evening is that if we are to take application from this psalm, if we are to say, I want to be happy, I want this blessing, and I trust that that is your desire, but if we are to be happy, if we are to be blessed, we need to learn that the Christian's happiness is grounded in Christ. And it's as we see that he is blessed and happy, that we then come to be the happy man, as a consequence, the happy woman, the happy child. So the Christian's happiness is grounded in Christ. First of all, there's blessing for us as we focus on the gospel. This Psalm 128, like so much that we have in the Old Testament, including the Psalms, is full of allusion to Old Testament temple and tabernacle worship. Now that might not appear apparent immediately in our first uh, English reading, but it is something that is suggested very strongly in the Hebrew language. If you look with me at verse 3, it says, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. By the sides of thine house. Now those words seem to be unusual. And I think we agree that those words strike us as unusual. Thy wife shall be a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. What is the sides of the house? Most believe that what's in view here is actually the lady, the wife, within the house. Now there would, I'm told, be an easier way to express that in Hebrew than as it is expressed here. So why are these words used? By the sides of thy house. Well, if you were to search out that word, and you'll see that that word frequently is used in the Old Testament in relation to the Old Testament tabernacle and to the Old Testament temple. And there's frequent mention to the sides of the tabernacle, especially in relation to the boards that there were for the tabernacle, Exodus 28, uh, sorry, Exodus 26, Exodus 36. You'll continuously see this word used. It's also used of the temple in Jerusalem, 1 Kings 6, and the Ezekiel temple, we call it that, in Ezekiel chapter 46. And so it reads here the signs of thine house. For the Jewish reader, their minds would be brought to think of how their house then was a reminder of the house of God. Their Little Hope was to be a reminder of a more significant building, as it were. So the word signs here is suggestive of the temple. In verse 3, we have at the end of that verse the word table. Children like all the plants round about that table. Did you know that in the tabernacle and the temple there was in the holy place the table showbread. But come with me then to verse 5. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. Now the word Zion of course is used in different senses in the word of God. It can be taken to refer to heaven. 
but it also or it is also used to describe Jerusalem. And surely that certainly is one of the ways in which this is to be understood in verse 5. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Now as we think of blessing flowing out of Jerusalem, how is that so? How did blessing flow out of Jerusalem, in particular because of the temple? And not so much the blocks of the temple, but because of what the temple signified. It was the place where God's presence was made known. It was the place where Aaron would speak. Do you remember how Aaron would speak over the people and the high priest would speak over the people? And so Aaron was never in Jerusalem, but Aaron was in the tabernacle. And later on, the high priest then would speak from the Jerusalem temple. They would speak blessings. The Lord bless thee and keep thee and so on. That was all in association with the altars. Remember, there was the brazen altar, the place of sacrifice, the place of bloodshed, the place of the burnt altar. Then there was the brazen altar, or sorry, the altar of incense holy place, the place of intercession. Both those altars speak to us of Jesus Christ and His priestly work. He is our sacrifice and He is the one that intercedes for us. Dear Christian, here is the gospel. Christ has died and He is the grave. He is your priest in His death and in His resurrection. He is then Emmanuel, God with us. This is what the temple was picturing. The Lord is with his people. And so then since Christ has come and tabernacled among men, the Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. There are blessings poured out of heaven upon us this evening because of Jesus Christ. We can say then this evening, I am blessed because I have been brought into God's presence, brought within the sides of it. I am blessed because I have been brought to the banqueting table, to the place of fellowship. I am blessed because of the sacrificial lamb giving himself for me. I am blessed because there is one who intercedes for me. And so here is a message that is focused on the gospel. How are we to be happy? We're happy when we see the gospel. If we want to live practical Christian lives, if we want lives that are being transformed, we need to have our minds continuously filled gospel. There's no greater time. There's nothing that can more minister to our souls than the gospel itself. Some have referred to this psalm as being the psalm of ordinary piety. And that is, and this psalm is not just talking about the priest or to apply it to our day. It's not just for the preacher or the elder deacon. The psalm is for every Christian. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. There's blessing as we're focused on the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Christian's happiness is grounded in Christ. We are to focus on the gospel. And then secondly, we are to see our God-given position and fulfill that role that the Lord has if you come then back to Psalm 128, in verse 2, Thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. And I want to go through some of these words again and see them as they relate to Christ. And then we'll come back and see how they relate to you and me. 
As this relates to Christ, thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. It is emphasizing to us that the work of Christ was not in vain. Remember how there was that great promise. He shall see his seed. Or Hebrews chapter 12. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It gave Christ happiness to see the fruit of his work. And if that was true, looking forward to see the fruit of his work, surely how true it is today. But as he sees the fruit of his work in his people, he's happy. He's blessed. I shall eat the labor of thy hands. But what you see there, verse 3, thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Our blessed Lord never married. But scripture does speak of the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is his church. His people are his bride. Ephesians 5, as we read earlier, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. His wife, his bride, is to be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. That is, when the Lord saves his people, he saves them to be fruitful. He saves them to abound. He saves them to be spreading, to be productive. He saves them that there might be this beauty, as it were, radiating from them. So Christ then, he is the head of his church. His church is to be progressing as such. Then at the end of verse 3, thy children, like olive plants, round about thy table. And again, as we take this to refer to Jesus Christ, he did not have literal children. Yet he is a father to the believer. He's like a father to Believer, then, every believer is to be like an olive plant, round about the table. So, from the base of the olive, there would come these little plants, and they would be drawn from the other olive. We are to be drawn as where from our Lord Jesus Christ. All of plants round about thy table. And uh, surely this idea of the table is the idea of feeding on. Being strengthened through. I want us to think then of how this comes to relate to you and I. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord and walketh in his ways. Now, when we come to the psalm, you'll see that the emphasis is actually upon the man. That is not to say that the woman can never be happy or the children can never be happy. But we'll find here that they are to be. But it begins, as it were, with the man. So verse 4, Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Now, if you notice with me in verse 2, Thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. Now the great emphasis here is on headship. Headship. So as we have this idea of the wife and the children, the man is in his place of headship. And as the man is in his place of headship, he is to enjoy the fruit, the labor of his hands. Thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. As he has feared the Lord, he works. And as he works, he eats the labor of his hands. Now, this, of course, is entirely in keeping with so many passages in the Word of God that emphasize the Christian man is to be a working man. The Christian man is not to be lazy. He doesn't provide for his own house. It's worse than that. So the Christian man then is to take Christ as his example. 
Christ as he came and labored in the earth. He was full of labor. And the Christian man then is not to be lazy. He is to be working. He is to be laboring. Not for salvation. We are to be laboring. For everyday needs. So in this headship there is labor. And in this headship there is love. Verse 3. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thy house. He loves his wife. He invests in her. And so as he walks with God, he is blessed. And he enjoys this additional blessing in the fruitfulness of his wife. Now certainly, in part, verse 3 is speaking of fruitfulness in her childbearing. And yes, more than that. His wife is productive in her spiritual fruitfulness. So the man is blessed. He's walking with God. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine. There is this growth. There is this productivity. And one a preacher spoke of how as he walked with God, wife was turned from being a raisin into a grape. And he was taking that thought from this idea of his wife being fruit from vine. And what he was suggesting was something like this. That when the Christian husband is not walking with God as he ought, he's not only depriving himself, but he's depriving his wife begins to whiz it up as it were, spiritually speaking. But when he is what he ought to be, he's enabling her to flourish. And the Christian husband then takes Christ as his guide. The Christian husband is to see the great challenge here in this psalm, and the challenge is that of headship. As we were reading in Ephesians 5, Christ's headship is a loving headship. Christ doesn't come and batter his bride into submission. He loves his bride into submission. So then a man could shout at his wife until he's blue in the face, she must submit. It's probably not going to happen. When he takes his place of headship seriously and loves his wife, that's when she begins to submit. And that's when this fruitfulness comes forth from her. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine in the sides of thine house. In this headship there is love, and in this headship there is nurturing. So we have the detail of the children like olive plants. For families back in Old Testament Israel, olive plants for some would be a very important source of income. We can see that in a number of places in the Old Testament. From the olive came the oil. And so there's this idea you invest in your family. As I mentioned when we looked at Psalm 127, it's not as much investing monetarily here. But investing in your family with your time, you will have gain. There'll be the oil as it were. And there's also this idea of longevity. Some will tell us that some of those olive plants in modern day Jerusalem can be traced right back to the day of Christ. Of course they've been pruned many times since then but the actual roots of those olive trees some say date right back to the time of Jesus Christ. They are plants that have great longevity and so it fits in with this idea in verse 6 of seeing thy children's children. There is this idea of being fresh perpetuity of a man having a lasting 
legacy. And again, as we saw in Psalm 127, the legacy is not to be a monetary one, or perhaps I should say, it's not solely or chiefly to be a monetary one. But what better legacy can a man leave behind than children that are going on with God? And then in turn, their children would go on with God. This headship involves nurture. Bringing up his children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And in this headship, he shows his union. His wife is joined to him. His children are his. And he is diffusing blessing upon them. You see, as we get a hold of this great truth, Christ is the head of his church, Christ is our Father. We are enabled then to reflect his pattern. And so for the Christian husband and father, we are able to take our position as the head. And that's not easy, it's a challenge. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. None of us have done that perfectly. The father is not to provoke his children. He is not to be that bad father giving bad gifts. But a good father giving what he knows his children are in great need of. And the Christian wife as she comes to this son. Her response will be, let me submit to my husband as the church submits to our head. Let me have this willing submission. The children, when they come to this psalm, they will say, Let me be that obedient child. Let me honor my father and my mother. Let me take my role and fulfill my role. Coming back to how I described this, there's blessing for us as we see our God-given position and fulfill that role. Whatever role the Lord has given you in your home, do it as unto the Lord. The blessing will follow. You see, homes that depart from this biblical model are homes that lose out. When we set aside Ephesians 5, Ephesians 6, home Christianity, our homes suffer, our churches will suffer, our society will suffer. You see that in society, don't we? And with all of these revolutionary ideas about the home, has it brought more home happiness? Not at all. Perhaps the home has never been such a place of discontentment and misery as it is today. Because there has been a departure from the ways of the Lord. The feminists had their lie. Didn't save society. We have those that today will seek to Redefine the whole positions of father and mother. That won't save society either. It will lead to its ruin. Let us get back to God's way. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. Psalm 34 says, O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any new thing. May the Lord give us a deeper desire after him to fear him and walk in his ways. In our hopes, in our individual lives, even in the work of this congregation, may we know the blessing.
bless him this Sunday most. We trust the Lord and bless his word to all of our hearts. We sing together the words of the metrical version of this psalm in the hymn book before we bring this part of the meeting to a close. Psalm 128. It's on page 122. Psalm 128, page 122. Blessed is each one that fears the Lord and walketh in his ways. We'll stand as we sing these words, remaining standing for. Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all.